title of the message tonight is The Art of Diplomacy. The Art of Diplomacy. Now, i got to give you a quick background story. So this is funny because I didn't really think about this, but last Thursday the background story was when I was in Illinois and I preached a sermon and then I was talking about, you know, how to preach and, and how sometimes to keep it, uh, 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 the, the attention, you have to add some things to your message or whatever. And now, after I tell you the background of this, you're going to think, man, he's just like trying to defend himself and he's like so easily offended or something. And it's not, okay? But when I was in Illinois, <laughs> uh, this comment was made, and I'll just go ahead and rat her out, Mrs. McMurtry. Uh, she was calling me diplomatic. She said, I'm diplomatic. And I, I didn't take that as an as a insult at all. I took that actually as a compliment, but this is some, the way that she described me in comparison to other preachers uh, that she knows and that she's had dealings with and everything, and diplomatic. So my mind started going to what exactly does diplomatic and all that, kind of, what does that mean? And so I started looking at that, and so here we are. The message is called, so when I put the title on Facebook, because I usually say what the my, all my messages for the week are going to be, and I said, the art of diplomacy. Guess who commented on there? Mrs. McMurtry. <laughs> Mrs. McMurtry. So if you're listening, this is inspired by you, Mrs. McMurtry. She says she was going to listen. So, <laughs> The art of diplomacy. Now, let me real quickly give you the best definition I can. I looked at a few different definitions and kind of put together what I think was a, a good definition to uh, help us understand what a diplomat is, okay, or diplomacy. Uh, a diplomat is an official authorized by diploma. That's where the word comes from. Diploma meaning just basically an official, like a, a paper of authority and a diploma. So a diplomat is official authorized by diploma who is sent out to secure and maintain foreign relations. Okay, so when you look up diplomat, it's talking about you know, an ambassador or whatever that goes to another, you know, foreign country or, or some, uh, some place, not necessarily another country, but some place, you know, to deal with uh, this other side and have relationships with them and have uh, come to some kind of agreement, whether it's a peace treaty or some kind of a, a deal that they want to, uh, to make, they have to come together and they have to figure out a way to, you know, come to terms. And so this art of diplomacy goes way back. Uh, I don't know how many hundreds of years BC, but back to the time of, of you know, the Egyptians and the Hittites, and they made some kind of a, I mean, probably went back all the way. We could probably look in the Bible and see where it goes back before that. But, but the records that they have of, of like official documents and peace treaties that were made by two individuals, right? It goes way back, historical. So you can see how the word has come to mean more than just an actual official representing the country or whatever, but it actually has now become this term that we use, meaning that when we go to talk to somebody else, we're very careful how we say things. We're very careful to maintain our relationship and, uh, and to come across in the right way. In fact, the dictionary will also say politeness is the word that will be used a lot of times. And the idea is you want to be able to make a deal or a transaction or get uh, them to agree with you or whatever the case is. And so in order to do that, there's a certain way to go about having that conversation. Now, this isn't something I've ever uh, like, like studied in the sense of read books and, and tried, to, tried to actually uh, learn the skill of diplomacy, right? There are classes out there that'll teach you how to do it. I've never taken anything like that. But I feel like over years of just experience and watching people and all that, this I have found that this is an art that you kind of acquire, like the, that you can learn how to do this. It's a skill that you can, you can gain. Diplomacy is basically about self-preservation in a way. You know, you learn how to be diplomatic when you realize that, hey, every time I try to get through to somebody, I'm getting shut off. You know, they're, they're fighting against me. Soul winners learn how to be a little diplomatic at the door because you realize that, hey, if I don't say something the right way, they're not going to listen. They're going to shut the door. They're going to be offended or whatever. I want to give them the gospel, so I have to learn how to be diplomatic, right? There's a polite way, a proper way to say that to be able to get them to, uh, to listen. However, <clears throat> here's another thing to, to, to note uh, real quickly, okay? And this is something that was actually brought up about, about me and being diplomatic, okay? And it's funny because I, I never really thought about it 
from that perspective. But a long time ago, many of you guys know this story, I had to make, uh, there were some certain doctrines and I, uh, uh, methodology that I was embracing in the ministry. And I realized like, if I tell people that I've changed my mind on this thing, some people aren't going to like that. Okay. And so now I had a group of people who believed that, but maybe I didn't agree with them on everything and on all sides. And then I had other group of people that hated that group of people. And if they found out that I had any dealings with that group of people, then they wouldn't want have any dealings with me. Okay. Now, when I'm dealing with one side of these people in a diplomatic way, what that usually, usually, not always, sometimes there's, there's no way to be diplomatic in some situations, okay? <laughs> what usually happens is you don't really make friends with either side, okay? And that's okay. That's okay. That's actually part of being, uh, being diplomatic. That's actually part of self-preservation, right? If you want to have lots of friends on one side, you have to have an extreme view, and you won't have friends from that other side, but you will have friends on that side. It doesn't matter. Politics, you can throw anything out there, right? Yeah, it's a particular ministry ideal, ideas, it doesn't really matter. There's extreme sides. And if you take one of those extreme sides, you'll be popular with that group that holds that belief. If you're diplomatic, some people say fence straddler. I'm not a fence straddler, okay? There's a difference. <laughs> but if you're diplomatic... You've not won friends here. You've not won friends there. But what you have done is you've kept yourself out of harm's way. <laughs> you've preserved yourself. Dipl diplomacy is, part, is, is, is partly about self-preservation. Okay, And so self-preservation, part of that is not being noticed. You know? So you won't, you won't draw a huge crowd to yourself if you're diplomatic. right? But you will stay alive. <laughs> okay? Now... I'm going to talk about in this message the negatives of diplomacy because there are some pretty big negatives. And then I'm going to talk about the positives. But the main goal I'm wanting to accomplish by the end of this sermon, Lord willing, uh, is that we will know the negatives, we'll know the positives, we'll see what the Bible says about being diplomatic because, as we'll see, I think actually the traits of being diplomatic are something that are taught in the Bible. Okay. Uh, but we'll learn how to be those without embracing the negatives of diplomacy, okay? And just for the record, since I'm calling myself out as being diplomatic, sometimes I fall into the negatives, okay? There's a saying out there or a thought uh, uh, that your, your biggest strengths can be your weaknesses. Does everybody understand that? And the first time I ever really analyzed that thought, I was thinking it in the terms of, of uh, somebody who is merciful, and then somebody who's like the opposite of merciful, they're just very like, you know, black and white, everything has to be done a certain way, right? Those are actually strengths. A person can have a strength where they see everything black and white, they stand for right, they'll never compromise, they'll never budge. And then you got another person who's super merciful, you know, and, and if you think about that, although these are their strengths, they can also be their weaknesses. So I've seen in my own life many times because I tend to be more merciful and loving and try to be kind. Now, I, I threw loving in there. Let me back up. Loving isn't always about being merciful. Sometimes loving is actually being harsh and telling people the truth, okay? But we want to tell the truth in love, okay? That's basically the conclusion of this, okay? Uh, so I kind of misspoke there. But I have found that sometimes in my, in my mercy... I'm overly forgiving, overly accepting, overly understanding to a fault to where that actually becomes the fault where, you know, now you're enabling somebody. Now you're, you know, you're compromising, whatever. That's a big negative. OK, but on the other hand, you got those who are, hey, I just not I'm not going to budge. I see, you know, black and white. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. And I'm not going to budge on that. Well, their fault could be that they don't have any mercy. And so nobody really cares what they have to say because they're just so pig-headed about, you know what I'm saying? They might be right, but nobody wants to listen to them because, so we, so where's that middle ground? You know, there's, there's both. And doesn't the Bible teach that? You know, what doth thou require of thee but to love justice, I mean, to, to, uh, uh, to do justly and to love mercy, right? And to walk humbly with thy God. There's a, there's a dichotomy we see a lot of times in the Bible where there's mercy, you know, and there's justice, and that God 
you know, embodies that, you know, he is able to do both of those at the same time. He's very just, but he's also very merciful. And that's a hard, that's a hard line to walk. Okay. So I want to be able to point both of those out and then show you from the Bible what it says, where we get this, the, the biblical principles of uh, diplomacy. Now, largely what I'm talking about in terms of diplomacy have to do with controlling the tongue. Okay, look at Proverbs 15. Hold, if you have, I hope you didn't lose it yet. Keep your place there in 1 Samuel 25. And then look at Proverbs. Fifteen. I, this this was originally going to be the text because this chapter is just full of of advice about controlling the tongue and having wisdom and discretion and all. But I just want to point out a few verses here. First, verse one: A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Look at verse 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Look at uh, verse 7. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. Verse 23. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good is it? Look, you can, if you can use your tongue wisely, it is actually going to give you happiness. It's going to give you joy. It's going to give you life, okay? And a New Testament example of that is in James, James chapter 3. James is kind of like the Proverbs of the New Testament. He just throws out a whole lot of a, a great wisdom. It's one of those books where you can kind of pick passages and you don't have to worry too much about the context. <laughs> James chapter 3, uh, in, in chapter 3 primarily deals with the tongue though. So verse 1 says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. Then he goes on to talk about how hard it is to tame the tongue and control the tongue. But you see this idea here that if you can control the tongue, man, you're on your way towards perfection. I mean, you're on your way to uh, to not offending, you know, and not being uh, condemned all the time. Now, listen, he said he starts off in verse uh, one saying, be not many masters. Look, there has to be masters there. There has to be in this world leaders who have to lift up their voice and stand up for a certain position or whatever, but they're hated. You know, they're hated by many people. And there's and so what he's saying here, hey, don't strive to be master. Don't, don't, you know, we don't need a whole bunch of masters. You've heard of too many chiefs and not enough Indians, right? Everybody wants to be the pastor or the preacher, you know, the one who just flings her down or whatever. And he's saying, look, don't strive for that. Because that's just going to lead to condemnation. We shall receive the greater condemnation. And it's okay. Some people, that's their lot in life. That's what God voice. They got to be loud. They got to be hated by men or whatever. We understand that. But that doesn't mean the average Christian just has to like follow their example and beat people up with their tongue or whatever because they think they're, they're, they have the same calling in life as this person. Okay? Uh, what he's saying is, hey, For many things, we offend all. You don't want to go around offending people. You want to actually, as much as possible, bring bring peace with your tongue and to bless with your tongue and to be nice, you know, to people. Now, I will point out the faults of of diplomacy, the negatives of diplomacy, but as a whole, this is something to be desired after, learning how to control your tongue properly. Okay, uh, verse 126, I forgot to read that, James 126. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his uh, own heart, this man's religion is in vain. So this is why sometimes somebody can be so right about something, but the way they say it, people are like, I don't really care what you have to say. Right? You're, not, you're not really doing anything for the cause of Christ because you have all these great ideas, 
but you don't know how to control your tongue. And so this is what the Bible says uh, over and over again that we're supposed to do, okay? Now, look at our text there, 1 Samuel 25. And let me give you an example. If you're following along the story of uh, Nabal and his wife Abigail and David, we see a picture here of diplomacy. Look at verse 5. David sends out his men to be diplomatic. He tells them how to talk to Nabal. Okay, let's start in verse 5. And David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus shall ye say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. And now I have heard that thou hast shearers. Now thy shepherds, which were with us, we hurt them not. Neither were we aught uh, missing un uh, unto them. I'm sorry, neither was there aught missing unto them. All the while they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy son David. So David's telling them how to go about talking to this guy. He's not like, hey, you better give us or else David's going to come cut your head off, right? You know David. You've heard of him, the giant killer, you know. No, he's saying go in there and tell them, hey, we've done you good. We wish your house peace and uh, and all this. And, and, and you know, he, he's trying to be diplomatic so that they can get what they want. But the Bible tells us about Nabal in verse 3. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail. And now look, she was, uh, here's what it says about her, she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish. Now, churlish, I had to look that up. I kind of know what it means. You can kind of get the, the idea from the context. But churlish, the word uh, of a, a churl, I guess, was just a person who was just a commoner, right? This also where we get the word vulgar, all right? So the same idea, vulgar, not, not vulgar necessarily like we use it today, but vulgar in the sense of just the common speech, right? Someone who didn't uh, use wisdom and understanding you know, to, to be diplomatic, basically, is what it's saying, okay? He was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. We find out later, not only that, he was a son of Belial. In other words, he was a wicked guy, all right? And uh, verse 10, Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David, and who is the son of Jesse? There, uh, uh, there be many servants now a days that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed uh, for my shears and give it unto men? whom I know not whence they be. So look, he's just being brash. He, I mean, he's not, he's not like uh, trying to be diplomatic in his speech. Like sometimes you even have to be diplomatic when you tell somebody no. <laughs> yeah, there's a certain way to tell them no where they're not going to be offended. They're going to be like, you know what, I understand. You know, just, <clears throat> just an example. I'll just I'll speak a little bit cryptically, okay? I'll be diplomatic. <laughs> uh, there's a guy who keeps calling me up in Iola, and long story short, he's trying to get money from me. You know, right? There's a lot of that that goes on. We get calls all the time, people asking for money, help with their rent, help with this, help with that. And, you know, sometimes you're tempted to be just rude to them and be like, look, um, this isn't a welfare organization. This is the church of God, all right? But this guy has got relationships with the church. He's been there, you know, a couple times. And so he thinks that he's got an in with me and he's trying to get this. And I've tried to let him down as diplomatically as I can and say, look, we can't just give out money to everybody that asks for money. You understand that, don't you? And there's a certain way to say no without just being insulting and, and disrespectful to them, okay? And so uh, this guy, Nabal, he's not one of those type. In the Bible, and it told us in verse 3, hey, he's a churlish man, you know, he's, as opposed to his wife who has understanding, she has good understanding, you know, this guy's not, okay? He doesn't, he doesn't care how he speaks with his tongue. Abigail is uh, very diplomatic. Look at verse 14. But one of the young women told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. But the, good, uh, but the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt. 
neither missed we anything as long as we were uh, conversant with them uh, when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us both by day, by night and day, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider that, that what thou wilt do. For evil is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such of the son of Belial that a man cannot speak of him, speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and uh, five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and a hundred clusters of raisins and two cakes, uh, 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses. And she said unto her servants, go on before me. Behold, I come after you. Uh, but she told not her husband Abel. Hey, if you want to be diplomatic, this is just a freebie, okay? This isn't part of the sermon. You want to be dip diplomatic, bring food. Bring food to the conversation, and you will win friends and influence people. <laughs> Verse 20, And it was so, as she rode on the ass, that she came down uh, by, the, uh, by the covert on the hill. And behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. And David had said, had said, surely in vain have I kept all, all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good. So, and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that pertain to him by the morning light, any that pisseth against the wall. How many thought I was going to preach on that topic <laughs> whenever I was reading the past? Okay, there's a famous uh, sermon by that title. Uh, let me see here. Verse 23, and when Abigail saw David, she haste, hasted and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, upon me, my Lord, upon me, uh, let this iniquity be and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thy handmaid. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst, uh, didst send. Now, you can see this as you go, how she is approaching. And here's a funny thing. If you look at David's relationship, I think he has like six wives. Uh, later on, he's got lots of concubines added, but he's got like six wives. Terrible relationship with his wives, okay? <laughs> he doesn't have a great relationship with his wives. But as you read this context, you end up finding, you, you start finding, he adds Abigail after the story you know, to be his wife and actually seems to favor her. He just really loves Abigail because she treated him right. She spoke nicely to him, you know, she fed him. I mean, that's a, that's a way to a man's heart, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, so you see this, she's very diplomatic and therefore she wins David's favor. Now, it's not right for her to turn on her husband like that. I'm not, I'm, that's a different message for another time, okay? <clears throat> so the idea is the Bible talks about being diplomatic. The Bible uh, uh, talks about how we're supposed to control the tongue. The Bible talks about handling ourselves, about having wisdom when we speak to people. Proverbs is just chock full of it. I only read just a couple verses. But we do want to point out the negatives first. So real quickly, I'll just point out some negatives here. Uh, this is just practical, you know, kind of logical. And then we'll look at more uh, verses as we talk about the positives. Negatives. Usually... In, in our world, okay, we live in a wicked world. And when it comes to diplomats, we're usually talking about, yeah, sorry, I turned that down a little bit, maybe too much. What we're usually talking about politicians, okay? And you can see real quickly where the negatives of diplomacy when you look at politicians and the way they do their d diplomacy, okay? You know, they send certain diplomats and usually it's motivated by self-interest and again, self-preservation, which isn't necessarily wrong, but sometimes when you're desperate and you're trying to preserve yourself and you're trying, you know, desperately uh, to get ahead and get what you want, your negotiations and your business deals end up being full of lies, right? And it's funny because I listened to this, uh, vi I watched this video. Uh, remember I told you there were classes that actually teach how to uh, be diplomatic? Well, in studying for this, I watched this video from this, the school that teaches one of these different courses. So they put these little YouTube videos on there. And this guy is, t is talking about diplomacy and how to be diplomatic when you talk to people and all that. And there's a part in there where he literally says, like a diplomatic person is willing to tell a little lie 
in order to be able to, you know, basically the ends justify the means. And he's like, and they have a secret hope that other people will tell them lies to avoid them having a certain hurt and everything. And I'm thinking, okay, he's just flat out saying, from the world's perspective, diplomacy is about lying, <laughs> right? Being so nice that you would even tell a little lie just so the, uh, you know, a bigger, a, a bigger good, so to speak, comes from it, okay? And this is what you see a lot of times with people who are diplomatic, right? Please don't judge me. I already told you I'm diplomatic. A lot of times when someone's diplomatic, you have to wonder, are they lying to you? Are they truly what they appear to be, or are they just flattering you? Are they just, uh, you know, telling you what you want to hear and giving you all these lies because it profits them and it's in their best interest? And this is a true danger of diplomacy. And so this is where the negative aspect of diplomacy would come from. If someone says, hey, you're a diplomatic person, I'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know if I want to be called that, right? I unless you mean the good stuff that I'm about to share here in a few minutes, okay? It could be when somebody's negotiating with you that it's all a trap, you know? They're using these skills kind of like a giant chess match, you know? I'm, I'm a terrible negotiator. In some countries, if you go to the supermarket, you better know how to haggle. I don't even know where the word haggle comes from. That's not like a bad word, is it? <laughs> haggle <laughs> just sounds like a bad word. <laughs> I'm sure there are some words I could replace it with that are bad. But anyway, you know what I mean by haggle, right? So you, they're selling you something for $10, and you know it's only worth $5. So the idea is you're supposed to talk them down to $5. So you'll say, how about $4? And they'll say, how about 9 And then you'll say, how about? And then eventually you're hoping to fall around that $5 because you know that's what it's worth. You know, that's, that's the idea. Well, I'm going to tell you what, I am not that way. And most men, from what I understand, aren't they? There are some guys that are gifted with this. But a lot of men are just like, hey, I'm walking right to this item. I'm paying for this item. I'm walking out, and I'm going home with this item. I'm not going to sit there and look at the prices and negotiate and say, well, you give me a, some guys are good at it. Not me. <laughs> okay. But you know, some people are good like that in conversation. They're trying to win an argument. It doesn't even matter what they're arguing, right? They're just really good debaters or whatever. And uh, they can say it in a pleasant way, you know, the, to, to win you over to their side or whatever. And sometimes it's just a big game and it's full of lies and it's full of flattery and all that stuff. And sometimes watching two diplomats flatter each other is hilarious. Now, let's see if you had the same picture in your mind that I do. Kim Jong-un <laughs> and Donald Trump sitting across from each other being diplomatic. Come on, these two guys are not diplomats but they are skilled in business. And they do know, hey, I'm, they know that guy's lying to me and I'm gonna lie to him and we're gonna make this look good and we're gonna walk out of here with a deal. They know that from the moment they sit down. They're diplomatic, but that's a negative sense of, of being a diplomat, diplomat. Being diplomatic can cause you to forfeit a position that you hold very dear. This is why most Christians like zealous Christians have a hard time being diplomatic because look, we hold beliefs very, very dear. And if you're just good at being a diplomat, you know, you have a danger of giving up your deep felt, you know, positions that you feel like, hey, I need to let everybody know the truth. And you'll be like, you know what? It's not important. I don't want to fight. And you'll become like a mega church, you know, everybody just hold hands and there's no, no doctrine or anything taught because you don't want to offend anybody. That's a big danger of being diplomatic. Sometimes it's necessary to fight in order to have peace, right? And sometimes even in the political world, they realize that and they don't even do negotiations. They just, uh, you know, they start talking with the missiles and stuff. All right, let me get to the positives now. Diplomacy doesn't have to be a bad thing, obviously. In fact, Many of the qualities that make somebody diplomatic, so to speak, come from biblical principles that we should, as Christians, be practicing and learning on a daily basis, figuring out how to be that kind of a person. Leaving those negatives out. We don't want to fall into those negatives, but we do want to learn how to be diplomatic in these ways. Okay, number one, and again, that, that video where that guy says, you know, it's okay to lie, basically. In that video... 
he hits on several of these points. He doesn't give the Bible any credit, but he hits on several of these points. Like if you're going to be diplomatic and he uses these words, one of the words is respect. Okay. Being diplomatic, a, a diplomatic person means you respect other people. Now, is that a biblical principle? Well, let's read a few verses. Matthew 7 uh, verse 12 says, Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law in the prophets. Jesus is saying, you know what? All of the law can be summed up by saying, you know, just do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Think about how much that, you know, this is why like against, you know, uh, those who walk in the spirit, you know, against such, there is, there are, there is no law, right? Because when you're walking in the spirit and you love people and you're about peace and, and you want joy and happiness and all these kinds of things, you're not going to start causing problems and making fights and all this kind of stuff. So here's what he's saying. He's like, you know, uh, uh, all the laws, you know, let's break them down into the, uh, you know, to the ones that we're very familiar with somebody. What do you want someone stealing from you? No. So don't steal from somebody else. You know, don't commit adultery. What do you want somebody taking your wife? <laughs> no, or lusting after your wife? No, don't, you know, don't, uh, uh, don't kill. I mean, that's an obvious one. <laughs> so part of how you treat other people is simply understanding that's a human being too. And I want to respect them as a human being. So wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are we supposed to respect? Well, how about this? The Bible says respect all men. That's what the Bible says. Respect all men. Men. Now we know there's reprobates. We know there are people that hate God. We know the Bible says, you know, there are people not even to, not even to talk to, right? Don't cast your pearls before the swine. We know Jesus himself turned his back on some people and didn't even give them an answer. And so we know that there's a time where diplomacy doesn't have a place. Okay. But we're speaking as a general rule, honor everybody, be peaceable with everybody. As much as lies within you, be peaceable with all men. You know, this is a biblical principle, and if somebody does this, they're more likely to be a diplomatic person. Again, Galatians 5.14 says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Somewhere in our society, we started calling it the golden rule, okay? But I, I don't know exactly where that came from, but I know James calls it the royal law. Similar idea. James 2.8, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture... Thou, uh, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Okay. Now, this is something that the Bible says over and over. You're supposed to love other people. You're supposed to think of them, you know, at least give them the respect that you want them to give to you. And this is just a biblical principle. A second thing is humility. Okay. Owning up to one's shortcomings. That's a literal quote from that video. I'm not preaching to you from this, <laughs> this is a secular video that tells you to lie. But that's a literal quote he said is like, we, you need to be willing to uh, own up to one's shortcomings. In other words, a humble per it's going to take a humble person to be able to get through some of the yelling, you know, some of the you know, insults that are given or whatever, and just say, you know what? that I'm not going to fall down. I'm not going to fall for that and start getting back and just fighting back and arguing and all this kind of stuff, because who knows what's causing that person to be like that. I know my human tendencies. I can get mad. I can say some of those same things. I'm just going to let it roll off my back. You know what I mean? And then you end up being a diplomatic person because you're not so easily offended. Now, again, that goes back to the negative. There are some people who have a false humility and they're just constantly like trying to make you think that they're just super humble and they're so lowly and all that stuff. Usually the fake ones will surface eventually. <laughs> okay. They'll, you'll eventually know, Hey, that person was just a, uh, you know, a fake from the beginning. But if you're humble, you can talk to people in a polite, respectful way and you'll go a lot farther, not necessarily in making friends, but maybe from maybe preventing you from getting some enemies. <laughs> Does that make sense? You might not be the most popular person, but you will be able to, you know, stop some, uh, some battles as you learn how to use the tongue properly. All right. Where was I? Humility. Okay. <clears throat> Matthew 18, four says, whoso therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Look, being humble in this world, being meek in this world, 
again, not very popular. You know what meekness is? Meekness is like having the power to do something and then choosing not to do it, right? Moses was one of the meekest men, the Bible says, and outside of Jesus, who no doubt was the meekest, all right? But think about Moses. You know, he had men come to him, and later on, the ground opens up and swallows these men, but they came up to him complaining and, and false accusation against him and everything. What does he do? He could, he could whip them up. No, there's no doubt about it. He was, a, he was a strong man, mighty man. But what does he do? He falls on his face before the Lord, right, because he's meek. Uh, many times he could have done something, but he, he refrains from it and says, you know, uh, for the greater good, you know, I'm going to refrain from doing that. And the Bible says that we need to be meek. All right, there, meekness is not weakness is a cliche, but it's true. Uh, some people think that, hey, that person is just meek and he's humble. Look, he's just a wimp, right? Well, let them think that because God's the one that's watching. And he says, hey, to that person, he's the greatest in the kingdom of God because he's actually learned how to control his tongue, control his behavior, control his actions, not get all bent out of shape because someone said something he didn't like, you know, or whatever. Uh, and believe it or not, even though you don't have maybe a lot of, of, of attention and fame, you'll enjoy the peace that comes with being a diplomatic person. All right. Proverbs 16, 19 says, Better is it to be an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Have you ever been around proud, arrogant people? It's not fun. <laughs> That's not fun. You could, hey, yeah, look, I'm dividing the spoil with all these people. Is that really the people that you want? No. No, it's so much better to just be simple, you know, be humble, let God reward you in the end. All right. And then the third thing is discretion. Okay. So these are three biblical principles that we learn that are very much uh, related to being a diplomat. Okay. And one is being humble. One is, uh, uh, what was the first one? Uh, <laughs> being respectful, right? Doing to others, they would have other, uh, you would have them doing to you. And then the third is discretion, okay? Basically, thinking before you do something, okay? Uh, being able to discern, you know, what's going to happen in this situation, right? And not lighting the fuse. I don't know. I think like, I think like maybe 99% of the people in, in the world like have no, they have no second thought before they light that fuse. You know what I mean by light that fuse? Like before it comes out of your mouth, did you not think about what was going to happen? <laughs> I remember on a bus route in Oklahoma City, we had some bad kids in, in Oklahoma City. And uh, really, seriously, like fights all the time and all this. And we, we'd go pick up these kids on the bus route. And there was this one guy, his dad was from, uh, from Ghana, West Africa. And, uh, and we'd go to his house and he'd say, He'd say, I don't know what to do about this kid. Reginald, Reginald, <laughs> I don't know what to do about this kid. And so he's like, he was just, he won't, he won't obey me. And he's like, and I spanked, I, I spanked him. I'll, I'll, I'll try to stop the accent, okay? So <laughs> I'll spank him and spank him and spank him thinking that that's going to, you know, help him stop being that way. And then he's like, all of a sudden, I'll get a call from the government saying, hey, you know, we're looking into this case. There's accusation that you might be abusing your child, basically, is what it comes down to. And so I'm hearing from his dad saying, look, I want to spank him, but they won't let me spank him. And then I'm hearing from him on the on the van. He's like, my dad beats me all the time and all that stuff. And and uh, and I'm like, well, what did he what did he spank you for? And he would tell me something stupid that he did. And I was like, well, if you don't want to be spanked, why do you keep doing that stuff? <laughs> Doesn't that sound, doesn't that make so much sense? But you watch somebody and it's like, they're always, they're always picking fights. You know, a couple maybe that, uh, a man and a woman that they just always fight. And you're just like, as soon as you hear one thing come out of their mouth, you're just like, uh-oh, here we go. And it just, Phew. how did you not see that that was going to happen? Right? Maybe some people just like that. But, uh, but a diplomatic person is like, you know what? I'm not going to light that fuse. I'm going to try to, try to transition this you know, conversation to something that's not going to be so explosive and, 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 uh, and make people upset. That's what discretion is all about. Have, uh, uh, having wisdom to discern human nature, basically, and how people are going to react. And I'm going to tell you, uh, maybe some people have just an ability to be able to think that way, but I think it's something that comes with experience and practice. You know, the more times that you have these things happen, you're like, okay, 
uh, we're not going to go down that road because I know where that leads. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and you can grow uh, over time. Uh, let me see here. Proverb, I mean, uh, Psalm 1, 112, 5 says this, A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Proverbs 2, 11 says, Discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee. Proverbs 19, 11 says, The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. Now, again, there are negatives that could, you could take all these things too far, and there are negatives certainly that can come from it. But do you see where over and over the Bible tells us to control the tongue? It tells us to, to use discretion in our matters and to have wisdom and have understanding and, and, to, and, and, to, and to just try to be peaceable with all men. I believe it's good, even godly, to learn to be diplomatic. Maybe we won't always use that word, but you understand what I'm talking about, I hope, after this message in our dealings with others, but we just don't want to become weakened by it because certainly you can go too far. And I've already admitted that sometimes I know that can be the problem with me. Uh, sometimes it will cause you to be enabling of others and allow them to continue in their error because you never were, you know, blunt enough. And look, by being a, a uh, diplomatic doesn't necessarily mean that you're not harsh sometimes. You're just, you're just, the way you present it is in an acceptable way that they can handle it and, uh, and it's the best possible way. And sometimes, like I said, sometimes diplomacy won't work. There's certain individuals, there's, doesn't matter how you deliver the message to them, they're going to get upset about it, okay? And so you don't want to take this too far. There's some great dangers that come from it. Obviously, we don't ever want to be involved in lying or deceiving a person just to keep them happy. Uh, but if, let's go to two more verses, then we're done. Uh, I've been reading these to you. Let's, let's have you turn to Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Verse 15. But, and here it is. This is what it's all about. Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. I read that in the middle of a sentence, so it didn't make sense. But speaking the truth in love, it's what he's saying to do. You know, focus on getting that truth to people, but in a way because you love them, right? Like when we go preach the gospel, it should be motivated by the fact that we want these people to go to heaven. We don't want them to go to hell. And so how we present that to them, we're very careful. We're very careful that they get that. Now, not everybody is. Obviously, there's some people that, went, that go out soul winning and, 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 you know, they have no tact in that way. They, you know, I've met some people like that or people that are way too nice. And so they, you know, never get around to actually telling that person, no, no, according to your testimony, you're lost and going to hell. Right. And so they don't want to do that. But we need to do it. We need to speak the truth. We just need to do it in love. Or another way to put it, look at Colossians 4, and then I'm done. Colossians 4. Colossians 4. And look at verse 6. Let your speech always be, I mean, sorry, be always with grace seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Now, some people will say, you know, oh, yeah, salt. You ever pour salt in a wound? <laughs> That's the way you got to do it, man. Put that salt in that wound and make it hurt. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying you want the words that come out of your mouth to taste good to the person that you're delivering it to. And look, the Bible says that, uh, what does it say? Something without salt isn't good. I can't remember, but I think it's like egg or something like that without salt. I have to look that up, man. It's, I'm, I'm losing. I'm losing it. Okay. So anyway, the white of the egg isn't it? The white of the egg. It's, it doesn't taste good without salt or something like that. But you understand what I'm saying, okay? Jesus said salt is good, so salt is good. He's saying right here, you're giving them your 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 food. Season it. Season it with salt. Make it taste good for the person. Take some time in how you deliver that message. You don't have to just like, I don't really care. I'm not here to win any friends. 
Yeah, well, maybe you should work on that a little bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Some people need to work on being diplomatic. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for just the ability we have to communicate one with another and, and to receive communication from others. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us be very careful how we communicate. Help us to uh, control our tongue when it comes to, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, uh, delivering a message. Lord, help us uh, uh, deliver it in a way that would be most effective to the person listening, that they wouldn't close us off, that they wouldn't uh, uh, just shut us out, but they would hear us because what we have to say is pleasant when it can be pleasant, Lord. But help us never sacrifice that uh, for uh, telling lies and being deceitful. Help us never um, be self-motivated to the point where uh, we would not tell the truth. Or, or uh, I just pray that you'll help us learn that, that, that fine line, Lord, and learn that art and the skill of uh, diplomacy from your word. I pray in Jesus' name.